Hello, my name is Pete Whalen. I'm sitting here with Joe Justice. We are at Agile Testing Days in Potsdam, Germany. We're talking about Agile testing, we're talking about Scrum, we're talking about all kinds of things. And Joe is here representing his employer and Team Wikispeed, and he's got some way cool projects he wants to tell us about. Joe, tell us about Agile and stuff. Thanks for asking, Pete. So I work with Scrum Incorporated. That's the company owned by Jeff Sutherland, the guy who ran the first Scrum team back in 1993. Dr. Jeff Sutherland saw I was doing agile work in manufacturing and physical product development spaces and brought me in to open up that part of the business. He said half the customers coming to the business now were non-software companies. Software wasn't their primary business. So now we run an extreme manufacturing practice. In that practice, we teach Scrum courses, coaching and consulting, uh, as well as strategic road mapping and agile portfolio management for legal teams, human resources teams, engineering design teams, productization manufacturing teams, line manufacturing teams, and even, um, even wage factory floor folks who didn't think that they could do anything cooler than Lean Six Sigma, but now they've found in working in teams of four to five people with a scrum master and a product owner, they're able to reduce the cost to make changes to the line, and that means faster innovation. Now I also run a pet project, my own hobby company, Team Wikispeed. Team Wikispeed's a nonprofit, and our mission statement is to rapidly solve problems for social good. We build the world's most efficient internally combustion powered road legal car, and we sell it all over the world. The first one coming to Europe is at the Frankfurt airport right now. If it makes it out of customs, we're bringing it into the conference and we'll lay it out across the floor as a flat pack. Conference attendees are invited to then build it with us using agile testing best practices in scrum teams coordinated with scrum of scrums. That's our excuse to bring it into an agile conference. The net effect is we'll have an ultra efficient, ultra low, low emissions vehicle in Europe to show that this technology is here now and then we'll be shopping it around to the major auto manufacturers in Europe to say, let's make more relevant, ultra-efficient products because they're already here and you're competing with it. How ultra-efficient? I'm glad you asked, Pete. On the United States EPA cycles, the city and highway, we've achieved 104 miles per gallon city in simulation of those tests and 114 miles per gallon highway in simulation of those tests. That gives us a combined score of 109. On the EU tests, it's a different test and a different uh, volume measure of fuel. Mm -hmm. For example, in the UK, that would be about 136 miles per gallon. On the German test, I'm not entirely sure. I'll be excited to test one here, but I think it's gonna be about 2.5 liters per 100 kilometers on the German test. The Japan test, it's less than a liter per 100 kilometers because they have a different test cycle. Sure. We'll find out together. That sounds like fun. Now, I'm going to beg the, the obvious question and, and ask about the, the scrum of scrums that is going to help build this. How successful do you see that happen? Because I'm about to ask the question that would make your boss absolutely crazy, and it's a good thing you're about to have a bit of beer. And I'm waiting dramatically. There we go. Because I run into an awful lot of people, and I say, so tell me about your environment. And their response is, well, it's Scrum, but dot, 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 dot. <laughs> Scrum is a very simple framework. It's fast, easy, and fun. The challenge comes when people try to hold on to other practices outside Scrum. And they say, but we have all this cultural inertia. There's all the way we used to do things. How do we keep doing things the way we always were and do Scrum? And the right answer is you don't. And so it's really easy to do Scrum as a startup. For an established company, it's incredibly challenging. They have to let go of the practices they're doing now. And that's where we end up with Scrum Butt. Yeah, we had the five meetings of Scrum, or one is an activity, but let's call them the five meetings or five ceremonies of Scrum. We have all five ceremonies of Scrum except for these two, and instead we have joint engineering reviews, and instead of having product backlog created for the teams, instead we have our leadership announce what we're going to do with a deadline. They announce it to the same time uh, to the stockholders our development teams. We say, yeah, well, you might not want to do that if you actually want this to be fast, easy, and fun. You're making it hard, brittle, and crappy. So if people have pigeonholed themselves into doing Scrum Butt, we won't be able to in 
give indicative results. They've invented their own framework. And if it works, I want to learn about it. But so far, it's brittle and fragile. We haven't seen too many successes when they don't at least have three roles and no more, five meetings or an activity and no more, no less, and three artifacts and no more, no less. Now, 353 is a pretty easy gauge. Startups have no problem with it. Established companies have to let go of a lot of things to get there. When they do, we see on average a doubling of velocity per employee obtaining the same or better quality spec and on average they vote back saying they wouldn't work any other way. 90% say it's, fat, it's more fun. That actually is really painfully close to my experience, which is depressing. I thought it was just me. Um, what you may be familiar with the blog post, and I've forgotten who wrote the blog post, which is really depressing because my mind just went blank. Um, it does. You should have a little more of the lager. This is going to lubricate the genius. There. I don't know about genius, but <laughs> getting a little dry. It's been a long day. <laughs> Within, th there was a blog post to the effect of we tried baseball and it didn't work. <laughs> I, I, have you seen that? Uh, I'm, I'm going to find the link and, and we'll make sure that comes up. But, but I've seen Ken Schwaber's post, which was brilliant. And in a post related, he says, uh, you, don't, you either play chess or you don't play chess. You don't, you don't uh, do chess but. And, and that's not quite the, I don't have the quote, quotation quite right. But it's either you play chess or you don't play chess. He says, you're either going to do scrum or you're not going to do scrum. That, that's it. It's like we played baseball and it didn't work. That's, that's hilarious. Yeah. It, and, and it's the same. I, I, I forgot about the uh, you play chess or you don't. I forgot about that one. That, thank you for reminding me. Oh, go team. Yeah. Ura. So tell me about you, you've got a car that you're building maybe if it gets here. Right. Right. In Germany. Wouldn't that be cool? Uh, we've sold 10 cars. That's the size of our startup. Um, all over the world, and we're delivering them right now to get feedback from them. We already have a factory that, uh, owned by a French company actually, but it's in the United States. It's near Seattle, Washington. And they give us free rent and free tools, like big industrial CNC machines, $100,000, $400,000 tools, depending. And uh, say, we want to make 10,000 of your cars, and we say, yeah, we want that too but let's get feedback on these 10 from our, product, from our product owner customers first. Use that to inform the backlog of what we'd actually want to mass manufacture. Lucky for us, one of those 10, it's car number seven. We had already delivered it and we brought it back. That customer said, send it to Germany. Let's get some Euro feedback. So these were enthusiast early adopters. We're sending it here. If we get to build it here, we'll then be sending it around all of Europe if we can to get feedback on how it behaves on European roads, in European fuel stations, uh, and how people relate to it, whether it matches well with the current insurance codes here as we attempt to make a global brand and really give existing manufacturers, I don't want to say something to terrify them, but our real goal is to not make, there were almost 100 million cars sold and produced last year. Even if we have a game-changing product, and I think we do, I don't want to have to figure out the logistics on how to make 100 million cars or have all those people get laid off. We want to make the world a better place. We want to encourage those companies to make more relevant products in the factories they have with the resources they have, which is why the marriage between Scrum Inc. as a coaching, consulting, and training company and Wikispeed as the proof that you can make game-changing stuff if you use these methods is a very happy marriage. Okay, that, that actually frighteningly makes sense. That, that's we so scare companies into being our clients. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not so much uh, um, overwhelming companies as it is resistance is futile. Inspiring them to say, look at the products you could be making. That's a much nicer way to say it, yes. Yeah, well, let's aim that direction. <laughs> oh, Pete. <laughs> yeah. Was there anything else you wanted to hit on the scrum butt topic? Oh, Scrum Butt. That, that's, scrum Butt is one of those things that's just dangerous to me, I think, because it's like we had so many organizations will take on the rituals and ignore the point of what the rituals do. And, and there was a company that, that, that I've been working with was very fortunate. There was a 
CSM course where it's supposed to be taught in town and the wheels fell off, the venue that it was supposed to be held at canceled or something bad happened and I get this desperate email saying, hey, we're looking for a venue, any ideas? And the boss at this company said, I got an empty meeting room. Good, good, good. <laughs> and, and so the, the, the instructor walked in and he said, if you guys have read the book, you know enough, now we're gonna talk about how you implement. Smart. For two days, he didn't talk about the stuff that they could read and pick up that way. He talked about implementation. How do you adopt? Because in his experience, and it matches reasonably with mine, it's not the, it's the implementation, not the concepts. Does that match generally what you've got or have you got other thoughts or ideas around that? Well, that sounds quietly brilliant, Pete, and I'm glad to hear it. Um, I'd like to compliment that by saying I find a lot of value in attempting to immerse people in a hyper productive team because that's harder to teach. Then they're able to walk into another team, no matter the level of Scrum, XP, Kanban, Crystal experience that team has and say this feels right or this doesn't feel right. Until someone's played pro ball, I would imagine, they don't know what it's like to train and perform at that level. If we can immerse someone in a 15x velocity scrum team, for example, which lucky enough we're able to do sometimes, then rotate them back into the environment they were, they're able to sniff out the deficiencies in their practice and process. So maybe that complements what you were just saying, talking about how to implement versus the rote memory pieces. In this case, giving them the feeling of what it means to be an ultra high performing team that maybe is one of the larger wins that we are able to give people now. I'll also add, by giving people an overwhelming sense of this has already happened, the world is already doing this, um, and I'm not quite summing it up. When I took my first CSM class from Jeff Sutherland, and that wasn't the first CSM class I took, it was shockingly different than any other class I've seen. He talked about ROI uh, brutally. It was, I, I'm used to Agile as happy people doing good work that they're proud of. And that's great. Jeff didn't touch on that at all. And I actually felt very cold because I have this not-for-profit mentality. I, uh, social good worker is part of my makeup. Sure. Yep. And he, it was all ROI and bottom line financials. And it was terrifying. And it was crushing. I left the class and I think everyone else on day one completely overwhelmed, like we'd been beat up all day and saying everything I thought I knew about how to run a company is completely outmoded and I've got to evolve if I'm going to be awesome at all. Day two was much more practical. Day one was a drubbing on the head. I asked him after the class on day two, Jeff, where's the social good motive in this at all? Where's the agile respect for people, the values in the manifesto that are people over process? Where is that? And he said, Joe, Here's how this works. <laughs> I'll paraphrase. This is how I understood what he said. He said, if we convince top management and all aspects of the company that the only way they're going to make money and survive in the marketplace is by adopting behaviors that make sense. Okay, Jeff, I'm following you so far. The only way they're going to be able to continue to speed up their companies is by respecting their people and bringing in all the agile values. That's the method to increase velocity and increase profit margin in the marketplace. He said, you aim for profit margin, and the only way to get there is by being a good person. And then I read into that, so it's like approaching Republicans, and the only way they can do the Republican agenda is to become very democratic. And I'm not entirely sure I nailed it, but I thought it was <laughs> hilarious. He did say it's completely subversive, and I think that's part of an underlying theme of all of Scrum. And so on that cheerful note, this is Pete Whalen with Joe Justice at Agile Testing Days in Potsdam, Germany. Thank you very much.